Good evening and welcome to World View, the international affairs show that brings you the news and views that other networks can't or won't tell you about. I'm Alan Mendoza. Our show tonight, National and International Security Policy, Is an Unquiet World the Correct Formula? Now, last week, the Conservative Party's National and International Security Policy Group launched its long-awaited final report, An Unquiet World. Anchored by the redoubtable Dame Pauline Neville-Jones, a former senior Foreign Office official, the report lambasted the government for its record, stating that the UK is ill-provided for disaster management in the event of a national emergency. Ministers were also criticised for damaging Britain's international reputation through naive state-building, undermining home security through treatment of ethnic minorities as groups, not individuals, and overstretching our armed forces. Prime Minister Gordon Brown's response, a firm declaration in Washington, D.C. on how he views terrorism, the announcement of new counter-terrorism measures, and a diplomatic coup to insert a robust UN force into Darfur. So, given this trading of blows, have the Conservatives now stolen the initiative on security matters, where opinion polls have previously shown them to lack credibility, or does a government maintain the whip hand? And what are the likely battlegrounds on national and international security policy, where we will see major clashes for the rest of this Parliament? Well, joining me tonight in the Worldview studio to discuss uh, this topic are the Director of the Centre for Social Cohesion, Douglas Murray, uh, Garvin Walsh of the Conservative Party International Security Group, and Dr Dan Plesch, the Director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS. Gentlemen, thank you uh, for joining me in this uh, sort of uh, heightened time of party trading on uh, sort of security issues. It seems to be the current Vogue thing. Garvin, let's start with you, um, as, as you've played a major part in uh, writing this report and uh, participating in the deliberations and so on and so forth. Um, do you feel, uh, let's just start, that the Conservatives have, have actually recovered credibility now on security issues? A recent poll pointed out that people believed that uh, Labour were preferable to the Conservatives on 52 to 20 percent on security matters. Does this report address that? Do you think the tide has turned? Yes, I think this, this report does, and what it sets out a, a new vision for security policy that has two, two, um, two main aspects. One, taking domestic and foreign security policy together instead of, instead of separately because of, because of the way that the world is now and all, everything that it gets, gets known as by shorthand of globalization. You can no, you can no lo longer have these things in separate little boxes. And secondly, it's our, our overall our overall approach is different from the government's. Is where the government has seem, seemed to engage in a certain amount of military confrontation abroad um, and a, a, a peace, appeasement at home when it's come to dealing with terrorism. We, we have instead, uh, we, we have a different set of policies that has, um, that abroad, a, abroad we... Um, Presumably you're not going to appease abroad, is no, that no, what you're abroad, suggesting? We're not, we're not going to appease abroad. In dealing with terrorism, sometimes military force is needed, but we need to be much more careful about how we use it. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's a clear differentiation in terms of what you would like to see between what the government thinks and you do. Well, well Douglas, do you feel the government's been doing a bad job both internationally and domestically? Um, not a bad job, no. Um, there are certainly quibbles to be made, and one of the good things, as far as I can see about this report, is that it's not by any means a wholesale sort of attack on government policy, and I think the Conservative Party actually ought to be congratulated for being relatively non-partisan the way it's approached this. I mean, it seems to sort of uh, acknowledge where the government has got some things right and uh, acknowledges where it hasn't. Um, so I think it's more constructive than I was perhaps anticipating it would be. But, uh, and where would you quibble with the government's then approach? On um, domestically. Do, 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 I mean, domestically. I mean, one of the one of the categorization of appeasement, for example? Uh, to an extent, yes. Um, look, I mean, one of the things which this report notes, which is a genuine improvement and uh, quite a milestone for this country anyway, is, is making it very clear that you shouldn't be treating, for in, for in particular, Muslim uh, communities within Britain purely as a religious group. This is a very important thing which the government has so far in this country got wrong. The Labour government's got fantastically wrong. We're approaching people through the mask, approaching people through their alleged religious leaders uh, who don't represent a significant swathe of uh, Muslims in this country. And uh, the government, by treating them purely as a religious group uh, and treating them uh, only as a group which have religious leaders, um, has made a great mistake here and actually, I think, encouraged uh, extremism or encouraged fundamentalism. 
And uh, if the followings of this report are followed, I think, I think we'd genuinely uh, be in a better place. Okay, well, uh, we'll come back with the sort of specific recommendations. Just, Dan, to get your view on the overview. I mean, do you share the broad thrust, if you like, of the uh, recommendations or the principles? Well, uh, to be frank, I mean, it's hard to say this is, you know, the, like Harry Potter, you described as long-awaited. There was scarcely a, a queue outside uh, the office for it. Uh, and if you look at it, the actual recommendations come down to suggesting that various new headquarters staffs and review processes be set up in government, mere bureaucracy. Now, uh, beyond that, there's a lot of fluff, frankly, mm. uh, about saying we don't like nation building, uh, for example, the way it's carried out. And I think that uh, the huge 800-pound gorilla is the disastrous war in Iraq, uh, and beyond that, the fact that we now find ourselves, NATO and the US, sucked into two unwinnable ground wars in Asia, in breach of every strategic uh, premise, with no prospect of them uh, being over, an administration in Washington which by all accounts is teetering on launching a new war with Iran, uh, and a return to unnecessary confrontation with Russia. Uh, and the prospect again of a nuclear armed confrontation and indeed nuclear war by accident with Russia. These are the big looming issues out there. Now, when it comes to the question of community cohesion and fundamentalism, let's be clear, this isn't just about Muslim fundamentalism. In all the relig world's religions, uh -huh. we have a fundamentalist problem. We have, uh, in America, a big problem of religious fundamentalism. We have American generals telling their troops to go off and do God's work. No, um, one, one case of that happened. Well, I've, I've talked, you don't, I didn't interrupt you, let me just uh, wrap up. Um, we have American uh, celebrity authors, not ostracized or criticized by politics, like Anne Coulter, you know, who write about conquering the Islamic. We find ourselves in the idiotic situation where the coalition is allowing groups of Korean Christians to go about trying to do God's work in the heart of Afghanistan. Now, what more idiotic uh, policy can you pursue? A, if you want to have people who aren't going to get themselves kidnapped, which would seem to be a daft uh, thing in the first place, and secondly, to try to convince people you're not about to carry out a crusade uh, pardon, when, you're sending, when you're sending Christian missionaries into the heart of their country. I can see you're seething. Yes, yeah, well, go on. Uh, look, <laughs> first of all, let's get it straight. Anne Coulter doesn't speak for anyone in the American government or anyone in the American administration. I didn't Anne say Coulter, she did. I said Anne that she's lauded on the circuit and not disavowed. No, no, no. Look, she is disavowed. You will not find members of the administration who will back what Anne Coulter is saying. And there's a good reason, which is they recognize that she is a popular crackpot. That does not mean she speaks to the American administration or indeed for the American people. She's a popular fool. Um, look, it is not official government policy in America or in Britain to send waves of Korean missionaries into Afghanistan. It is something that has happened, but is not policy of the US government. It is not the policy of the US government to evangelize in Afghanistan or Iraq. We know if it were. Um, you really? talk about uh, crusade. You, you, think you, talk a, about, you think there is a policy? You talk about crusade. What, what I haven't noticed much of a policy. slip of the tongue of George Bush, a stupid and regrettable slip of the tongue. Uh, Do you think he regrets there. it? I think he does very much so. And um, look, I mean, to, there's one really easy way to not deal with the big problem of our time, by which, of course, I mean Islamist fundamentalism. There's one big problem, there's one big way of skirting around the issue, uh, and that is to pretend that all religions have fundamentalists and all fundamentalisms are the same, and, uh, you know, we have Bible Belt Christians in America. Well, look, when a Christian uh, does do something reprehensible, uh, when they pretend to do so in the name of God, they do not get the backing, financial or otherwise, of the West. Well, we've got half government. a million dead in Iraq they right now. It's more than Al-Qaeda can dream of. Not done in the name of God, not done in the name of uh, America, uh, not done because well, done America, America, America are killing America those people. Largely done in the name of done God. Done in the name, I think you'll find, of Allah by people who kill their co-religionists, maybe to spite America, but nevertheless it's them that's murdering their co-religionists. The vast majority of deaths in Iraq are either caused by the collapse of health care or mostly 
uh, according to all the statistics, as a result of coalition military action. Let they us let us uh, break this up one minute. Talk come, to doctors. Let, let's hit it back to the report, though, to Dan's initial point, which is, it's true, isn't it, though, that uh, if you like the 800-pound gorilla, are the campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq? David Cameron today, I think, I, I noticed, uh, has announced, you know, we've got to win the war in Afghanistan, yeah. we'll continue there. Bit, bit sort of, you know, more uh, hazy on the whole Iraq issue, not quite sure where the Conservatives necessarily stand on that these days. Why, why has the report really not focused on those major campaigns? I think, I th I think the, the report has, has focused on um, Afghanistan and Iraq. Our criticism of the, of the government has been that they made many, many mis mistakes um, in, in the Iraq campaign, but the Conservative Party su su support, supported the um, supported the campaign and, and continues, continues to support the campaign. Would you support uh, military action against um, Iran? Uh, Liam Fox said he's prepared to support uh, the use of nuclear weapons against um, Iran. Are you prepared to support that? All the Republican candidates for uh, the presidency have said on television that they would support the use of nuclear weapons against Iran to prevent it getting Has nuclear we weapons, would you? We, 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 hope, we hope that we we can ma manage a diplomatic, diplomatic solution to the problem. But, but Iran. all this wimpy well, UN well, is not well, going to well, get well, anywhere, well, is it? Well, Who well, thinks the UN and the EU are going to get a solution? Think that, it, we don't think it's right to um, take, take anything off the table okay, for negotiations. Okay, so do you think that the UN and the EU are capable of producing a, getting the Ayatollahs to give up the bomb? The, it's, 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 now, it's now a united tran transatlantic effort to try and persuade okay. the Iranians to give up So do you think they're going to give it up? Let, 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 let finish the points, as you quite rightly said, yes. To, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll come on to the Iran issue in a moment, perhaps, and look at it. I just want to focus, though, just uh, to have a little look at some more of the specifics here in terms of what's going on. It, it seems that the Conservative Party's approach can be broadly classified, if you like, Douglas, as more libertarian in action and Labour perhaps a bit more on the authoritarian side, particularly when it comes to measures looking at domestic security. Now, let's look, for example, at uh, uh, detention of suspects without uh, charge. Um, where, of course, uh, there have been hints the government would like to increase the, uh, the days that people can be held from mm. 28 to maybe 56 has been canvassed as an option. The Conservatives have come out absolutely against that, as have the Liberal Democrats, saying that his against civil liberties doesn't serve any purpose. Uh, again, the whole ID cards issue as well as, uh, has you know, uh, fallen on very similar uh, paths along that way. I mean, can we see this divide, and which of those approaches strikes you as being uh, the more effective in dealing with terrorism? I don't think it's, I mean, I mean, you could say that the Conservative Party is sort of outflanking Labour on this issue at the moment. I mean, mm. it's seen, it's seen if, it, if it keeps doing this as the sort of more liberal party on these issues, you know, and anti-authoritarian measures, as you say, like ID cards and like uh, uh, 90 days. Um, I, I think this isn't actually a problem with the Conservative Party. It's a problem with the Labour Party not making its case very well. Um, the uh, Labour government, if it does want to extend the periods uh, of detention without trial, really does have to make a much better case for why it's mm. needed. Uh, in the absence of that case being made, of course the Conservative Party is going to be opposed to it. Um, I thought that was sort of evident. Right. Dan, I mean, your view on these domestic measures? I mean, Brown's announced also this new beefed-up border well, we seem as well. Well, we seem to have forgotten about um, Ireland, the disaster of internment without trial. Uh, the fact that if you look at successful British imperial policing and counterinsurgency, the sine qua non are uh, to maintain the moral high ground, uh, Guantanamo, and, uh, the, and Belmarsh, and to strictly adhere to the rule of law. These are essentials which are being squandered with the uh, development of longer and longer periods of detention. And they aren't effective. That's the problem with them. Uh, it just doesn't work. It makes the situation uh, far worse. Well, I mean, um, I don't think you can say they don't work. I mean, there hasn't been another attack on the American homeland since 2001, so it could very easily be argued that Guantanamo has worked. Interesting point. Now, now Garvin, let's uh, again look at the... Uh, the essence of this sort of communities approach we were looking at earlier. Douglas uh, briefly mentioned, obviously, the, the approach within um, treating communities as individuals rather than um, groups. Could you perhaps unpick that? I mean, I, I'm a bit puzzled by that whole terminology. It seems a bit gobbledygook to me, a nice, you know, <laughs> friendly thing to say. But what does it actually mean? I mean Douglas seems to th think it means that you'll be, you know, not treating people through religious leaders as such, but going from directly. But can that work? I mean, I, I, just to give you a point of view, I was canvassing just yesterday um, in, in Shadwell, um, which is in the heart of uh, Bengali London, and you had whole estates of Bengali uh, you know, uh, British immigrants who've come in, and um, it's quite clear that certain people took lines from other people. Now, how are you going to break through to them? Well, what, 
Well, our, our whole approach to community cohesion and the security of the country is, is, is based on how we can build a stronger society together so we don't have to resort to the kinds, kinds of repressive legislation that this, this government se seems to think is the way forward. And in order, in order to do that, we need to correct um, one of the mo more serious mistakes that's been made over the past um, prob probably five to ten years, which is dealing with self-appointed and often unrepresentative religious groups as the government's way of dealing with um, the Muslim communities of Britain. It's focused only on um, the religious aspect of their identity and ignored the non-religious exactly. aspe aspect yeah, of their I identity. Agree. And um, there are, this is something they so have some, sometimes done, done abroad as well, where they, they think that the way to um, reach out to countries where people happen to be Muslim is purely through a religious leadership, mm -hmm. in, inste instead of fo focusing on um, a aspects that both, for example, British and Indonesian businessmen might share. Mm. They, there is too, too much um, emphasis on trying to speak to the Indonesian religious leadership. I, I quite agree, but I think I actually mm. extends beyond that. The problem is an over-concentration on faith. The vast majority of the population are agnostics. I'm a devout atheist, and I think there's a real problem in the amount of attention given to faith mm. over reason in our society. I would like to send my child to a reason school. I don't have that option. I haven't looked at it as weird if I suggest it. And there is a whole business you choose, like you go private or you go God, or you pretend to be religious to get into a good religious school in central London. Uh, that, I think, is a terrible state of affairs, uh, forcing people into religion on false basis simply to get uh, a decent education. So I think an overemphasis on religion in general has been the bane of this government. And we need to remember the, um, uh, the importance of reason uh, and the enlightenment overall and the protection of the values in the Enlightenment. Well, we, first, we, this we, is a false antithesis that's being set up, the notion that reason and Enlightenment stand on the opposite end of the spectrum from uh, faith. And as you know from the Regensburg Address and many, many other things, uh, faith and reason are not opposites. Um, well, not regarded as being so by large swathes of this country and others. Um, and once again, the problem is not religion as a whole. The problem is Islamism. It is political Islam. That is the problem. We do not have a great problem in this country with extreme I mean, Hindus. D uh, Douglas has got a point, hasn't he, Dan? I mean, forget about America for one moment. In this country, the problem is Islamic fundamentalism, isn't it? That's the community, if you like, that is, that is the most cause for concern. Well, indeed, uh, but if you look at the countries where we have been uh, doing our, our conquering and our dominating, it isn't India. They got rid of us 60 years ago. <laughs> Uh, if you look at uh, so in your Islamic view, terrorism is absolutely caused by foreign policy. Not entirely, mm. but it is a huge factor. And indeed, you know, our own intelligence services said so in advance of the Iraq War. This is not a you know a George Galloway position. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the American CIA man uh, shares book, uh, Imperial Hubris. You know, he wrote that Bin Laden was. Uh, it was as if Bin Laden had been sitting in a cave chanting with mind control over Bush, please invade Iraq. That's the view of the CIA. One man not the CIA, a and the CIA in any case. It's oh, yeah, the CIA is a bunch of useless liberals. We know that and should be closed down, I'm sure, and replaced <laughs> I'm by American I'm glad you agree. I'm glad you agree. Wonderful, we reached an agreement on that. <laughs> we agree on, on that point. <laughs> foreign policy, useless and overfunded foreign policy the cause of terrorism? No, of course not. I mean, is it an aggravating factor? Yes, probably. Um, but then you're offered the choice of whether or not you have a chance to run your own foreign policy on your own terms as you think see, you see fit and see fit to protect your own people and to help people in other countries, or you decide to have that policy dictated by people who let off car bombs in Baghdad or London or anywhere else. So that is the choice being offered you if people decide that we honestly ought to listen to Islamist nutcases. But, um, Dan, Dan is going to be disappointed because this is where the the machinery of government and the bureaucracy does actually matter because what the government sh should have done on receiving its assessment from its own spies that um, the Iraq war might ag aggravate terrorism, they should have then taken security me measures to deal with that. Exactly. You can't act in the world uh, and simply run away every time that um, s someone else might disagree with your policy. But you, can so take, you can take steps. They could, have, they could have spent more, they could have spent more time um, beefing up the security services better to address the threat that they had said would happen. Okay. They needed to take steps in Iraq to better plan for the um, post-conflict phase. Does that mean phase. the Conservative Party does accept that foreign policies cause terrorism? We don't accept anything so 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 simplistic. It's be ter terrorists are of are of 
of course, motivated by a number of factors, one of which, one of which has been the Iraq War, and David Cameron has, has said as much. But it's much more complicated than that, and I don't think you, I don't, I don't think you get anything by, ta by taking by taking the simplistic approach of saying this is, sim this is simply a foreign policy problem, ter you terrorism is simply that. a foreign policy problem. It's not. Um, yeah. it, and it, and it, it, needs, it needs to be continually repeated, but September 11th happened before um, our invasion of Afghanistan. We invaded Afghanistan in order to deny this sanctuary the Taliban had been giving, given al-Qaeda that allowed them to launch such attacks. Indeed, but uh, let's be clear. Uh, the uh, American forces staying in Saudi Arabia after the 1991 Gulf War you know, was the reason that bin Laden and company uh, decided this particular extremist wing, it isn't a question of Islamist uh, as a whole, we're dealing with a particular faction within a faction of Sunni Islam um, with respect to most of this. And most um, uh, Islamic people you know, are as um, you know, extreme as, you know, um, you or I might be Church of England. You know, they, have, they, they like their, their, their drink and their pork and the rest of it. So let's not get uh, carried away with this. But I must return to this question, it is only uh, Islam. I uh, had the great pleasure of being at John Bolton, uh, mm. President Bush's, one of his favorite diplomats. His confirmation hearing with Jesse Helms. And Jesse Helms, uh, out front, he said, people have criticized me, and I won't do a cod uh, South Carolina accent here. People have criticized me, he said, Jesse, for saying that uh, at the end times of the Book of Revelations are coming and that John Bolton is the sort of person I want to have uh, standing beside me in those times and I reiterate those times are a coming John Bolton is the sort of person I want to have beside me at that time and he was chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, elected by his peers in the Republican Party and nobody came out with a white coat and took him away I that's the ideology driving uh, this administration Last word on the subject. Well, it's definitely not the ideology driving this administration. Otherwise, they'd be doing different things. They'd probably be doing them more successfully, and uh, they would be more open about what they're doing. Uh, the fact is that the White House, the current administration in Washington, does tend to dive between policy and policy. It comes over all uh, liberal interventionists, but then uh, rushes back to an old school uh, realist style of approach when things go badly wrong. Uh, if it had any really clear drive like that, we would see it. As it is, we see a strange flip-flopping, uh, inability to stick the course on any one particular um, direction, and I think oh, that's... An ideology, uh, I wouldn't say the ideology, so I'd agree with you there. Right, we've reached agreement. I'm going to stop it there. <laughs> <laughs> time. But well, let's move over to your articles. Uh, Dan, let's start with you, because you have a news of a rather interesting conference. You well, just, we just uh, had a conference held. on corporate accountability uh, at SOAS, uh, where we were discussing Adam Smith's proposition that the limited liability formula in the modern corporation is a fundamental violation of rights, as he put it, to allow one group of people to benefit simply for their own profit by being excluded from the general rules of society is simply not reasonable. And we, are, in our discussions, it became clear that more and more people from different walks of life and different continents uh, held the same view, that we have created a tyranny of the unaccountable few in the name of liberalism and democracy because the owners of corporations cannot be held accountable in law for their actions. You only, in this model, as mm. I'm sure we all know, uh, are, yeah. are, are liable for the amount of yeah. money you put into the company. And, not. and the classic example, most recently, is the Fair Pack, but also those poor men up in Northwick Park who suffered terribly in an experiment that went wrong. The owners of the company shut the company down, so the liability they faced was uh, removed and set up a new company the next day. That is allowed, uh, nothing wrong with that legally, and that isn't a bad apple case, it simply points to the broader problem mm. that we've created. And then we ex when we say we're exporting freedom, we're actually exporting a system that is a boon to every kleptocracy and post-tribal elite who find in the heart of this freedom a means of protecting their wealth permanently from uh, any legal recourse. Well, Douglas, I've heard that's a fascinating uh, skit on things, and certainly something I haven't heard before in that sense. So, uh, I mean, it's interesting that you held that conference there. Uh, are we exporting, you know, authoritarianism through capitalism? Is that the way? Right. It's a long time since I was able to stomach any long event at SOAS. A long time since you were able to stomach any long event at SOAS? Well, in terms of sort of broad brush uh, <laughs> dismissal of one of the world's top universities, Oh, yeah, I don't know. Is, 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 is it? Is it? 
<laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Pretty shocking. What was the conclusion then? I mean, other than we are doing Oh, this. more research, of course. More research. Yeah. Another conference. <laughs> more research, another, another conference. Another conference. Garvin, what what did, you, oh, Garvin. Well, didn't they look into the difference between the civil and the criminal law here? And if you have a well-functioning state where there is the rule of law, people can be held accountable even if they own companies for breaking, breaking the criminal uh, law. No, if well, you have a badly run state, no, if, you're a show, if, you're talking about. if you own a company that carries out criminal acts, uh, you have no liability whatever. Yeah. And of course, all the parts of the world we are exporting the corporate-only model, this corporate totalitarianism that is being foisted on the planet um, at the moment, we are, we are putting a situation which is uh, worse than the aristocracy before the French Revolution, because at least those aristocrats were accountable to the king. More research needed. Garvin, your story. <laughs> right. In the, in the next couple of weeks, there are going to be lo local elections in, in Lebanon, and this is very interesting because it's the first serious test mm -hmm. of public opinion there since, um, since last summer's war and since um, the campaign of assassinations against um, pro-government deputies. And it will be very interesting to see whether, um, whether Hezbollah is a able to be an as effective a politically organized force as it, as it used to be. Um, there was a fascinating mm. poll um, released about a year, a year ago where they asked Lebanese people from the various relig religious um, communities which, which side they thought won, won, won the war last summer. And a majority, a majority of Shiites thought Hezbollah had won, but a majority of um, Sunnis and Christians thought Israel had won. Mm. That's interesting. Douglas, uh, Lebanon dangerously split. Uh, we, we've seen various attempts to topple the government. Um, dare to make a prediction about the local election result? Hard to say. I haven't been out there for a year or so, um, and uh, I'm assured by friends who are there and have just come back that, uh, yes, feeling on the ground against Hezbollah is sort of satisfyingly high. Um, really? I hope that remains the case. I hope, they re I hope they realize the extent to which Hezbollah, uh, much like al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, has used their country as a, a launch pad and um, should take responsibility when the people it launches against hit back. Mm. I think, uh, I haven't been out there, but I think uh, Hezbollah probably did uh, lose quite badly. Mm. It's interesting, John Negroponte, uh, then head of in American intelligence uh, coordination, uh, said that Hezbollah was the principal deterrent that Iran had to America launching an attack against uh, Iran. I think what we've seen uh, the, the administration carrying a very successful policy of removing Syria and a Syrian-dominated uh, government from uh, Beirut, um, isolating... Don't, uh, I, don't, the be, I don't think you can the, say that. Excuse that's me, uh, uh, the uh, uh, reduction of Hezbollah, which may all be very good things, um, and I wouldn't be in the least surprised if we do find ourselves in a major war with Iran uh, sooner rather than later. Well, let's the keep Syri the, yeah, the, Syri the Syrian government in uh, the, the pro-Syrian government in Lebanon wasn't removed by act of um, American um, active American foreign policy. The United mm -hmm. States gave its support to a popular popular movement that arose after the assassination of their prime, prime minister Rafiq Hariri, and it, that popular support meant that Syria wasn't able to use the kind of uh, military force to suppress the popular movement that it would have in the absence of uh, American attention. Well, the interesting thing will be, we'll see if that popular support continues in these elections. Well, that was uh, their view. This was indeed Worldview. Join us again next week for another topical discussion.